the talk is divided into these four parts. I give a short introduction to the biology of aging, then the two yeast models of aging, and similarities between um, replicative aging in yeast and the so-called Hayflick aging. Okay? Hayflick aging is a phenomenon that was discovered by Leonard Hayflick decades ago, and he was the first to show that human cells in culture, uh, after a certain limited um, divisions, just stop dividing and eventually die. And when we started doing aging research in yeast, one of the first things in collaboration with somebody working on Hayflick aging was, is there a similarity? And you will see there is a lot of similarity. Uh, then we have worked on the role of mitochondria and of oxidative stress in aging during most of these 10 years or so. So I will give you an impression of what mitochondria really are doing in aging. And then the shortest part is the importance of stem cell populations in the human body in aging of a human person. And again, this is a, a modeled by yeast uh, replicative aging. And on the other hand, the post-mitotic aging that is also very, very important in humans for certain cells like the most important neurons of the central nervous system, this is also mimicked very closely by post-mitotic aging in yeast, and I will very, very briefly show this also. And in the fourth part, you will also see a thing that uh, keeps me busy during the last few years, and that is the role of asymmetric segregation of damaged material. That was really discovered and is a very, very important and general uh, concept. It was in discovered in yeast, and it was in the meantime shown that this occurs in every cell division of a eukaryotic cell. And I will talk about why that is so important for rejuvenation. And rejuvenation of a cell means, of course, uh, the backside of it is the aging of the other cell in a cell division. One of the two uh, daughters, when yeast we can say mother and daughter, ages, accumulates the damage, and by asymmetric segregation uh, keeps the damage to itself so that the daughter cell is rejuvenated and enjoys the full lifespan that is characteristic for the species. So now I have given you um, a short overview, and now we start. So we are in Italy, and I love Italian painting. And what you see on this centuries-old painting is the phenotype of an old man and the phenotype of a young boy. And the young boy is the grandson, and he loves his grandfather, but he is also shocked as you can see on his face, by the changes that old age induces in a person. This is another more prosaic uh, picture. Here you have newborn young yeast cells. Here you have a young boy who was 13 or 14 years at that time. Here you have a terminal old mother cell, and here you have an old human. And I think that was meant to be the title page of a book which I wrote and edited uh, last year, together with Michal Czaswinski and Peter Laun. And I think these pictures are so really convincing that aging is something so general that there must be a similarity even between species that are so different, like a unicellular yeast and humans. What do we want to know when we do biological aging research? These are some most important questions, but by no means all 
questions that you can ask. Can natural aging being discriminated from diseases of aging? I will probably not have time to go really into detail here because I want to limit myself to one hour. So if, if it's 55 minutes, please protest. Okay. Um, does a genetic program of aging exist? Very important question because the, the aging research community is totally split. The one side says, yes, there is a genetic program and aging developed in the billions of years of biological evolution because it has a positive adaptive value for the species. And the other, the other camp says, total nonsense. This doesn't, and I am part of the second camp. I, see, I say it's total nonsense and I have very strong arguments for that, but if you ask me, I will explain it. Now we, have, we don't have the time. Uh, that leads us to number three. Is aging positively selected for an evolution? I think no. And the fourth question is, is rejuvenation possible at all? And the answer is, at the cellular level, rejuvenation is a fact. And if it wouldn't occur, uh, living cells had long ago died out. So it is there, it, you can measure it, you can observe it, but a totally different question is rejuvenation of a complex uh, organism like human beings, this is a very doubtful question. If, if Aubrey de Grey, one of my colleagues in aging research, would be right, then you could, by genetic engineering, change human biology so that we live forever. But I think that's a nonsensical dream. And when you look at his program, you will see that the things that he is suggesting just simply don't work. So rejuvenation, meaning to make a young boy from an old man, is not possible. And I don't think that we, but also not our grandchildren, will, will see that, that this is possible. Okay. First, uh, the the, the only well-known uh, manipulation of aging organisms that can increase the lifespan and can, to a certain degree, uh, restore capacities that you usually have only in youth is caloric restriction. But probably many of you know it. It works very well in rodents. It works well in um, mice, in rats, in gerbils. And this here is a, a very strong statistically significant experiment. You have uh, a survival curve uh, in a very convenient way plotted as a logarithm of chance of death against age. And you see that these two curves, the control, and the calorically restricted curve are very, very different. Uh, by caloric restriction, you can increase the lifespan of a mouse by about 30%, which is a lot. Think that a human may live to 100 years, that would mean 130 years. It, the question is not very well answered. Uh, if that is also true for primates, and if that is also true for humans. For humans, we will never know a real answer, but for rhesus monkeys, there, there, there was an experiment going on in, in America, actually two experiments, and these experiments were con conducted over the course of more than 40 years, and the result is in the one experiment, the rhesus monkeys lived longer. In the other one, they didn't. And, but the health of these rhesus monkeys in both experiments improved a lot when they were already old. So the answer is yes or no. Is it applica applicable to uh, humans? The answer is yes or no. A 
Another thing, and that's the only two interventions I'm now discussing, is antioxidants. Uh, the median lifespan, this is the difference between control and experiment in the median lifespan. And there's a big, big difference. And the only uh, <coughs> intervention that was used here was a strong antioxidant was fed uh, to the mice in this experiment. And they lived longer. They were also healthier. But it, re applies, re it applies only to the median lifespan, not to the maximum lifespan. So the question comes up, and I want to deal with this with, in two minutes. Why is that not being done uh, in human medicine? And there are two reasons. Number one, uh, side effects of such a treatment are too big, and it, it is just ethically not possible to do that. And number two, uh, just feeding antioxidants is certainly not enough because we are not dealing with uh, the question to have as, as many antioxidants and as negative a, um, a redox potential as possible. Uh, we are actually dealing with a dynamic equilibrium. And um, um, deviation from the equilibrium in the one, uh, in the one uh, experiment uh, leads to an, an, a surplus of oxidants, and that is bad. But going to a surplus of reductants is also bad. And there are oxygen radicals that play an, a, a very important role as me, uh, second messengers in signal transduction in uh, human cells. And when you uh, flood the human cells with antioxidants, you prevent that, so it, it's not good for you. Um, another antioxidant is this PBN. It's a spin trap. And I'm not talking at length about spin traps because of time reasons. But this spin trap was used. It was applied to old gerbils. And the gerbils' cognitive abilities, although they were already old and had a loss of memory, and I will show you, I will take one minute and show you how you can measure memory in such animals. The loss of memory was corrected and the gerbils found their way in a maze much more successfully than untreated. Okay? This is the number of trials, the number of errors in finding their way, this is large because they are old and have lost memory. Here they are treated with the spin trap and the value is back to the young value. They are again able to memorize the way in a labyrinth, in a, in a maze. This is from the science paper where this was first reported and this shows how you perform such experiments with mice. There is a platform under the surface which the mouse cannot see. And in the first trial, the mouse swims around and around and around, doesn't find it. And after eight trials, it goes directly to the platform. Now the old mouse has lost memory and is very bad with this experiment again. And after treatment with the spin trap, it becomes very good again. Very briefly, <coughs> coming back to the, to the statements I made in the beginning, is aging uh, positively selected for an evolution? Is it an adaptation? Is it adaptive at all, or does it occur by chance? And this has led to numerous theories of aging. And 
The one that is really extreme is the wear and tear theory. That means it's only chance damage to all cellular components, to DNA as well as to proteins, as well as to membrane lipids and so on. And these um, mutations and uh, damaged proteins and lipids uh, have effects on the cell that are very well studied. And one of these effects is a strong increase in oxidative stress. Okay? And the other extreme uh, theory is it's, it's an adaptation and there is a genetic program. And we, we must uh, age because it is, uh, it is necessary for the species to survive, which as you can hear from my formulations, I don't believe that. Um, another important uh, theory was the theory of mutation accumulation. Do we age because over our lifetime we accumulate more and more somatic mutations in our somatic cells? And the answer is, the short answer is, uh, yes, we do accumulate mutations. You can measure it. It's not easy to measure. It, it requires the most advanced DNA sequencing equipment that is only now available. It is especially true for the mitochondrial genome. But the question is totally open if this is the cause of aging. You must always be very careful to uh, discriminate between a correlation and a causal relationship. That is a particularly difficult question in aging research. Then, antagonistic pleiotropy. During evolution, uh, uh, traits and alleles have been selected for, which are good for the species. And I give one example, uh, alleles that increase the fecundity in young age. Alleles that lead to a higher number of uh, progeny in young age. And the same mutation, the same allele, uh, in some cases, and it was really studied without going into details, can be very bad for you once you are 70 years old. And that these aging researchers call antagonistic pleiotropy. Okay? And this is a fact. It occurs. But it's not really uh, explaining all of aging. And the one thing that obviously is taking the case uh, is wear and repair. So the, all the damage I'm mentioning can be in some way repaired. We can talk about how this is repaired. Talking about DNA, it is DNA repair. Very, very well researched. Talking about proteins, difficult topic. Uh, the proteins must be recognized. They must be degraded. And the rest that cannot be degraded must be asymmetrically segregated between mother and daughter in a cell division. And the mother takes all the damage and dies, and the daughter is rejuvenated. Uh, for those who are interested to really go into aging, I recommend this book. This is more than a 1,000 pages. And it, in particular, it deals with aging research in other species. I give you one example. There is the question, are there species on Earth, biological species, who don't age at all? Is, is that true? Uh, some researchers think it is true. Certain fish don't age. And it, it's not a contradiction, because you can die naturally from aging, but you can die from infection, and you can die from accidents. And even if we wouldn't age at all, this wouldn't mean that the Earth would be covered with humans, because there are other reasons for dying uh, besides aging. Yeah. In brief, we observe something that some people think is a genetic program of aging, because in every model system, we, we've, we found point mutations which increase the lifespan. So this points to a genetic program. But when we look at the genes in which these point mutations were found, 
then we see that all these genes have something to do with the genetic program of stress response, a particularly oxidative stress response. So what, in my view, what appears as a genetic program of aging is in reality a composition of several genetic programs of stress response. Now we come to a short uh, overview on the, of the two aging models in yeast. Number, number one, chronological aging. And I, I see Jason sitting here who really is doing these experiments. And <laughs> um, that means yeast cells, after using up the glucose and the other essential nutrients, go into stationary phase and of course don't divide anymore because there are no nutrients and they then, these cells then uh, survive uh, in the spent medium for something like two, three, four weeks. And then they die. And what happens during that time is called chronological aging. And there is a lot of similarity to post-mitotic aging in the human brain, for instance, but also in other parts of the human body, I remind you that more than 95% of all cells in our body are post-mitotic. Only a very small fraction is actively dividing. And the other uh, model is replicative aging. Even if there are enough uh, of nutrients available, uh, a mother cell can undergo only between 20 and 30 cell divisions, and then this mother cell greatly changes the appearance and the genome and the whole composition of the cell and undergoes uh, apoptosis, as we have shown in, in, in one of the key papers in this field, and then dies by apoptosis. And that is very, very reminiscent of a stem cell population in the human body. Think of the red bone marrow stem cell population where you have asymmetric uh, divisions. You recreate one stem cell and one differentiated cell. So the stem cell would be the daughter that is rejuvenated. Stem cell is rejuvenated. And the differentiated cell that is on the way to the final differentiation, let's say an erythrocyte, the, st the, the other cell has aged because it, it has a limited lifespan. And for that reason, replicative aging or mother cell specific aging is a very important part of aging research in yeast. And we have done nearly exclusively work on replicative aging. This is an example that shows you how much a single mutation in this SCH9. The SCH9 is a, uh, a homologue of the a human uh, protein kinase B or uh, AKL. And knocking out this gene increases in this chronological aging experiment, uh, increases the lifespan by a very large factor. Now the, um, the increases that we see in certain mutations that I show you in replicative aging are not as big as this, but they are very appreciable. In, uh, I will skip this. It just shows you that um, in, in, the, in the stationary phase, in the chronologically aging yeast cells, we have two cell populations. One dies quickly and the other one dies very, very slowly. And the, the one that dies very slowly are replicatively young daughter cells, which accumulate reserve carbohydrates and for that reason live for a long time, and the other cells are the older cells, replicatively older cells that don't accumulate a reserve carbohydrate. This is shown here in these electron micrographs. Now we come to replicative aging. The one remark about Hayflick aging. Hayflick aging uh, is the ability of a primary human cell culture to undergo a limited number of, of cell population doublings 
and after that number of doublings, they cannot divide anymore and they live for some time and then undergo apoptosis as our colleagues have shown who did this uh, work. And um, you find in the literature, and it's very important, that the Hayflick aging depends very much on the, uh, the presence of oxygen. Most people who do cell culture do it in normal air with 21% oxygen. And that means that uh, the Hayflick aging occurs rapidly. When you go down to a more realistic uh, oxygen uh, partial pressure, as for instance at, in the periphery in, in human muscle, you have not 21%, you have about 5% oxygen. And when you do that, then suddenly the Hayflick aging occurs much, much later. And in some papers in the literature, you see that even with some primary cells, there is no Hayflick aging at all. So it is uh, very much dependent on oxygen. We, again, we come back to oxygen, okay? This is replicative aging of yeast, one of our experiments. This is the wild type. There we have this sigmoid curve, characteristic of the wild type, and there we have the median uh, replicative lifespan, which is about 22 in this strain, 22 generations. And in this mutation, which is a mitochondrial mutation, a mutation in a protein of the mitochondria, we have a much, much longer lifespan. Again, a hint to the importance of uh, respiration and mitochondria in this process. This is from an old paper by Jaswinski. It shows you that the mother cells become bigger with every generation. They make daughters in every generation. These daughters are rejuvenated and are, here, here they are are rejuvenated and enjoy the full lifespan. And after a certain number of such divisions, the mother cell apoptose and die. Light microscopy of uh, young daughter cells. This is one spectacular end stage mother cell. This is the mother cell. No more cell cycles are going on. This is the last daughter. This is the um, second last daughter. And they have initiated these um, cell cycles, although the previous cell cycle was not finished, which is against logic, because the cell cycle checkpoints guarantee normally in young cells that a cell cycle can only be initiated when the previous cell cycle is finished. So here, this is lost, meaning the cell cycle checkpoints are lost. And what I cannot show you in detail, but what is also true is these cells are anuploid. These cells are, have mutations, and some of the mutations lead to the loss of cell cycle checkpoints. And this is again the sigmoid uh, survival curve defining the, um, the, the, the median lifespan of the, of the strain. The, the old cells have lots of butt scars. The young cells don't have butt scars, but only a birth scar. Staining with DAPI shows that old mother cells frequently have more than one nucleus and frequently the, the morphology of the nucleus is, is very aberrant. So that underscores what I said about uh, anuploidy, about uh, polyploidy and so on. On the other hand, the young cells have well-defined nuclei and in every case, just one nucleus, of course, in one cell. Now we look at the actin cytoskeleton. In a young cell, the actin cytoskeleton consists of dots and cables. At this uh, phase of the cell cycle, 
in an old cell that is still dividing, you see the actin cytoskeleton has collapsed to these large actin patches. That tells us a lot. And interestingly, in the old UVEC, we also see the collapsed actin cytoskeleton here. What is UVEC? UVEC means human umbilical cord endothelial cell, and it is one of the mostly used primary cell cultures for these experiments. Why? Because it's easily available as a new primary cell culture uh, from umbilical cord. Again, UVEC, nuclei and actin cytoskeleton in, in replicatively young UVEC, and here the much, much bigger, older cell with the deformed nucleus and the changes in the actin cytoskeleton. Okay. Now we come to the role of mitochondria in this process. In eukaryotic cells, the oxygen radicals, in particular the first radical produced that gives rise to all the other uh, raws which are so deleterious for the cell, is the superoxide uh, anion with this unpaired electron. And contrary to what people believed 20 years ago, this uh, superoxide has only two possibilities in the respiratory chain where it can be formed. One is complex one, and the other one is complex three. So the electron is transferred here from a flavin nucle uh, FMN, flavin mononucleotide, to oxygen. And here it is transferred from uh, <coughs> the so-called ubiquinone uh, radical to um, oxygen. This process does not happen in complex four, where the, the oxygen is then, in the end, reduced to water. Yeah. What is the amount of superoxide that is produced in, under normal conditions? It, this is a very hard question, but the best estimate is now around 1%. Uh, around 1% of the total oxygen that is respired ends up as superoxide. And the superoxide gives a large number of secondary reactions and then a large number of these secondary metabolites called ROS for reactive oxygen species with practically everything in the cell. And important in this respect is the everything comes to one radical, which is the most deleterious, that's the OH radical. And the OH radical is highly mutagenic, and it makes a lot more mutations in mitochondria, because in mitochondria, the genome is not protected by uh, the chromatin. And the same uh, OH radical also attacks lipids, the, uh, the unsaturated uh, fatty acids in lipids very, very easily, and what comes out of these reactions is highly toxic, again, highly toxic and mutagenic um, compounds, and they must be removed. And this is a very active part of research and not finished at all. New things are discovered every year about this. Now, the involvement of mitochondria uh, can be imagined in three ways. Mitochondria are involved in, in the aging process through generation of oxygen radicals. They can be involved because having less ATP means an imbalance in the cell that has to do with aging. And also, because mitochondria have an active participation, also in yeast cells, an active participation in, in, in apoptosis. And of course, these three things are interconnected. They are not mutually exclusive. All three things are true and do occur. In, in our work, 
we showed that uh, several um, genes that code for proteins of the mitochondria can be mutated in a way that leads to a uh, longer life. One example is the TCTP, a very, very interesting protein, translational controlled tumor protein. The other one is the AFO1, uh, which is also a mitochondrial protein and uh, has to do with mitochondrial translation. But the exact mechanistic relation between mitochondrial translation and long life is still an open question. Besides radical production in mitochondria, we have also studied radical production by NADPH oxidases. Now, I cannot give you a lecture now about NADPH oxidases, but uh, this was the first NADPH oxidase that was found in yeast. And not very surprising for us, we showed in a paper published in PNAS last year that uh, these oxygen radicals that are made by, by, the, um, by the NADPH oxidase YNO1 have a signaling function, and the signaling has to do with reformation of the actin cytoskeleton. That, that was uh, the, main, uh, the main finding. We now look briefly at markers of apoptosis. <laughs> um, the first marker has to do with the accumulation of ROS in the mitochondria. In very old cells up here, this is a mitochondrial morphology in these old cells. You will be a little bit surprised uh, that these are only dots. And in wild type cells that are undisturbed by stress, you don't see dots, you see uh, an, a network. But these old cells already have built up so much uh, oxidative stress without external stress that their mitochondria are small and roundish. And you see that here. And when you do the exactly same treatment with young cells, you don't see anything. This is just to show that, of course, both populations of cells do have mitochondria. This is a non a stress responsive mitochondrial strain, mitochondrial stain, sorry. And then here is a late, relatively late uh, marker of apoptosis that is very well known in human cells. It's the so-called tunnel staining. The tunnel staining detects uh, DNA strand breaks. And as you can see here, the old mother cells have to nearly 100%, all of them have uh, large amounts of uh, DNA strand breaks, while the young cells don't show this phenotype. It, an early mark of apoptosis is the inversion of the plasma membrane of the cell, uh, which can be recognized by annexin 5. And this is a old cell preparation, you see these cells have started apoptosis. And as a control, we also do the, um, uh, as, as a, we check for uh, holes in the plasma membrane of the cells, which would allow a, another stain to enter the cell. And it doesn't occur. And in the young cells, we don't see this, and very occasionally, if a cell is already lysed, which is an accident here, then we see it, but then we always see uh, the, the, up, the, the uptake here, which means that the cell is already lysed. This is the lysed cell. So in short, old cells are annexin positive, young cells are not. Last part, we still have 10 minutes, yes. it's okay. The questions we are asking here are of course unanswered questions in human medicine. Do organs of the human body or humans uh, 
age because they lack stem cells in old age. This could be a possibility, but the answer to make it very clear from the beginning is no. Even centenarians have stem cells that still divide. Uh, only the, the biochemical quality of the stem cells in a centenarian is uh, recognizably different from the stem cells in a young person. Okay? And the other question I want to pose, sorry, the other question I want to pose is, what is the role of asymmetric segregation in stem cell divisions? And as I told you, this asymmetric segregation of damage was first in a very, very nice um, a science paper uh, discovered in yeast, but subsequently also shown to really occur also in higher cells. And it seems to be a very general principle. And I even dare to say that without this asymmetric segregation, life would have died out long time ago. Yeah. What was known for a long time is that the asymmetric segregation of stem cells results in different gene expression in the new stem cell and the differentiated cell. That is very clear. And there's lots and lots of, of literature about this. But the new question is, is there also an asymmetric segregation of damaged material? And the answer in this case is yes. Now this is the famous paper by our friend Thomas Nyström from Göteborg in Sweden of 2003. This is the yeast mother cell. It's not a very old mother cell. It's a middle-aged mother cell, and this is her daughter. Here is, in fluorescence microscopy, a stain for protein carbonyls. And you see the protein carbonyls are there in the mother, but not in the daughter. And protein carbonyls are the product of oxidative damage to proteins. Okay? Here is a stain for the mitochondria, for porin. And you, again, you see that there is oxidative stress. The mitochondria are small and round. And here you see that about 30% of the protein carbonyls are in mitochondria, but the rest is in the cytoplasm. Now, one very quick uh, reminder. Protein carbonyls you see very often in literature because it's easy to stain them. It's easy to recognize them also on a protein gel. Okay? But by no means is it sure that protein carbonyls are the only or the most important damage in old cells. It's just something you can measure very easily. Okay. Now this is uh, just to show you that in skin, in human skin, there are several populations of stem cells, and the most important one are the bulge cells that are in the hair shaft, you know, in the hair uh, follicle. And there is a stem cell specific marker here. And when you look at the bulge stem cells in a centenarian and in a young person, you see that both the young and the old still have this stem cell marker here. So that is one example, but not the only one, to show that it's not the loss of stem cells that causes aging. Only the quality of the stem cells changes, but we know very little how it changes. Okay? This is for you to read if you're really interested. <laughs> Maybe you have read it. And I am just showing uh, yeah, this slide. This is a, a, a very long and very tedious and very complicated experiment, but I make it now short. We, we took a mitochondrial protein, aconitase, 
that has an iron sulfur center. And this iron sulfur center makes it extremely sensitive to oxygen radicals. So it is, in, even in a mild uh, oxidative stress, this one protein loses activity very quickly. And then we did the GFP fusion, and we determined that it loses, and first we determined that the fusion protein is enzymatically active, okay? Then we determined that the fusion protein does not lose fluorescence when it loses enzyme activity. And then we determined that this fluorescent fusion protein has a very long half-life in the cell after the production is shut off. And then we isolated old cells and looked at the distribution of the fluorescence and of the enzyme activity in the mothers and daughters of very old cells and in the daughters of young mothers. Okay? Here we have two experiments. Do young mothers, they uh, form daughters. What happens to this uh, fusion protein? And here we have old mothers. They produce daughters. And what happens to the fusion protein? And the answer is the old mother retains very little of the active protein but nearly everything of the fluorescence, making the specific activity, meaning enzyme activity divided by fluorescence, very small in the mother, meaning that the rubbish is concentrated here, while the little remaining active enzyme is segregated to the daughter, and specific activity is very high. On the contrary, in young mothers, the two uh, specific activities are nearly the same. And that was the first uh, undisputable um, proof that the non-functioning mitochondria, because non-functioning acon aconitase means non-functioning mitochondria, are the non-functioning mitochondria are retained in the mother and the functioning mitochondria are passed on to the daughter in these old mothers. Therefore, I'm proud of this experiment because it was so difficult to do. Yeah. And the conclusion is, as I have said already several times, it is unclear if there exists a Hayflick limit in vivo in the human body because we see uh, stem cell populations still in centenarians, but in a way we don't understand by now, these stem cell populations, they still divide, but they must be different. Think of skin stem cells and think of the skin of a, of a 100 year old person. This skin looks very, very different from a young skin. But, in the majority of cases, the stem cell population still exists in centenarians, and in very few cases, we actually uh, witness the exhaustion of a stem cell population. That is the case for melanocytes, but that is the only example I know of. Okay, I just made it within one hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>